Welcome back for another episode of the Happy at Work podcast with Laura, Tessa, and Michael. Each week, we have thoughtful conversations with leaders, founders, and authors about happiness at work. Tune in each Thursday for a new conversation. Enjoy the show. Okay, so welcome everyone to the Happy at Work podcast. And today we have with us Brant Cooper. Hi, Brant. Hi, how are you all? We're doing great. We're so happy that you're here. So we're going to go ahead and get uh, started. I have one of Brant's books with me, uh, Disruption Proof. And so, you know, you are the author of The Lean Entrepreneur and Disruption Proof. And so let's start with a key question that comes up in your writing, which is how do you define leadership? Well, well boy, leadership has evolved quite a bit over time. So I, I, I think uh, in, in today's world, I think that leadership is often uh, knowing how to lead given a particular moment, given environment that you're in, given circumstances that are around you. And so there's I think that there's a, a a greater requirement in leadership diversity skills than uh, perhaps in the past. And I think it's really brought on by the level of uncertainty. I, I guess today I often think of, when I think of leadership, I think of uh, the ability to say, I don't know, which I think 50 years ago, if you defined leadership that way, you would be hard pressed to get find a leadership position. <laughs> I love that answer, Brad. Uh, in your writing, you discuss the need for leaders to adopt learning practices. And what are the biggest obstacles leaders do face in adopting those learning practices? Well, I, I think it's it's really just what I what I just said. If if you actually know everything, then you don't need to learn. Or if you pretend to know anything, then maybe you're learning in secret, but you're not willing to do it with your teams. And so I think that. Uh, I think that we face a lot of uncertainty in the world today uh, and really in business, uncertainty exists all over. And uh, and so just the ability to differentiate between when you know, like market-based evidence that something is true versus having a lot of conviction or perhaps your own biases hide the facts that you don't really know. And, and just merely the fact of saying, okay, I don't know puts you into this learning mode. And so I really think that that's, I think that there's still in a lot of companies, a, there's a culture around not being willing to, or not being able to, or fearing uh, not knowing. I think that that is um, so interesting because I what you're describing are um, behaviors or I feel like competencies of of a leader being able to have humility and to have empathy, which are these quote unquote soft skills that, like you said, if leaders had, you know were seen as empathetic 40, 50 years ago, they may not have been considered leaders. And now we're saying that empathy is emerging as one of the top leadership traits. And you've also talked about being in these times of uncertainty and crisis, and we've just been through a pandemic. Um, companies are now adjusting and aligning to uh, new normals, a new normal as it relates to remote work and hybrid work. And for companies that are struggling with this new normal, we've seen companies who have made very dramatic you know, statement saying everyone back to work and then everyone quit. <laughs> and then you've got companies who are like, okay, we want to be flexible, but we're having a hard time creating an organizational culture that where everyone's, when everyone is in separate locations around the world and so forth. So how, like for companies that are struggling with this new normal and, um, and really trying to figure out what is the right thing to do as far as do people return to work? Do we do hybrid? Do we do fully remote? Is there one right approach and what would you advise to these leaders and how they run their companies? Yeah, there is, there's definitely not one right approach. I think what reading all of the articles and and around this remote work and the hybrid work and all of these type of things, what struck me was the lack of empathy developed for employees. 
And it was as if people had to, leaders had to come up with policies without, without understanding what the ramifications of those policies were going to be. I, I, I just find it extraordinary. I think that, you know, not to p- pick on Apple and Tim Cook, but, you know, he's, he's sort of walking around talking about how much he enjoys seeing all of his uh, employees and colleagues in the office and the energy that that brings him. And that's amazing, you know, good for him. But to assume that then that's the way everybody is going to see that, it seems pretty silly to me. Not everybody obviously is in Tim Cook's position. And so I think that, I think people often get empathy wrong in the sense that understanding people deeply does not mean that you're going to necessarily implement policies that address all of those needs, right? I mean, you have to be able to, you have a, a, a diverse group of people, it requires policies aren't always going to be appreciated or, or you know, win over everybody. But, but the more that you understand that diversity and, and the fact that you've got a heterogeneous workforce, the better that you can at least understand the implications of your policies. Um, so I think that's number one, is that the first effort should have been and should still be is to understand what are the circumstances of your employees and why is it that they do want to work more from home? And really, what do they miss about the office environment, right? I mean, these things just aren't binary. There's lots of young people that need mentoring and maybe that's better uh, in the office or there's uh, people that coming out of the pandemic, lack the social part of the office. And so I think that it's not really just so binary. And so uh, forcing a hybrid that, you know, Monday and Friday, everybody's at home and Tuesday, Thursday, everybody's at work sort of doesn't doesn't solve for that either. Uh, To make a short story long, I guess the thing that I would also recommend is uh, I talk about in the book how I think that the team is sort of the new unit of work. And I I think everybody inside of a company should be put on a team, even if the work sort of naturally doesn't have to be done by a team. And the reason for that is, is that the team automatically creates a social structure, which I think is more important now in remote work. I think that there's team members will hold each other accountable for not only work, but uh, values and, and ethics and those type of things. And, uh, And so I think just even that small step can start figuring out what what the remote work ought to be, because really the team ought to be deciding, would it benefit them to get together? And so maybe they can get together in a co-working facility instead instead of in the office. But if you allow the team to figure out what is the work that they're actually going to do to achieve a particular objective, and then what makes the most sense from a from a team perspective, then then you're you're starting to allow people to to solve their own problems. I I would love to real quick, Michael. But I know you have another questions, but I would just love to quickly comment on that because I think that coming from higher ed, so both Michael and I were teaching in a higher ed institution at the start start and during the pandemic. And very quickly, what happened to faculty at high, in higher ed was that we all, you know, had to go remote and had to teach remote. And because as professors and faculty, and I think there's a lot of people who are in similar roles across many different industries where you might have, as you just said, you may not have been on a quote unquote team, but you were in this collective environment, right? Where you were, you saw people every day and so forth. And then when you went remote, I know as a faculty, it was like me, myself and I teaching this class and, you know, didn't really have the ability to connect with other peers to talk about and and explain different ideas and so forth. And we, we also kind of lost our faculty meeting structure as a result and everything. And it, it became very isolating. So I think that's such an important point around, even if you don't necessarily need a team, you should be part of a team because it does provide that social structure. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Michael, I, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, that, uh, you know, a lot of the stress put on the middle management was trying to figure out if their people were sitting on you know, video all day long. And, and so I even think, again, trying to develop empathy for the management, you know, they, they're, they are becoming more reactive and end up 
you know, sort of micromanaging more when people are sitting in their office because they're fearful that people are not working. And if we could shift that to a team dynamic, again, I think that there's a lot of accountability that peers do in a in a way that's better than, you know, sort of managers trying to figure out if you're on, on Zoom all day long. I love this response. And it's I, like I mentioned, I, I teach in, in multiple institutions and there's one where I'm being completely micromanaged. And I think you just I can't explain why it's happening. He doesn't think I'm working, but I right. am. Well, <laughs> I didn't know that. If we could get to outcome based management, we could solve a lot of those problems. But I think one of the reasons why people don't want to go back into the office is that they've realized that when they get to focus their time and schedule their day, so that when they are working, they're focused, they actually don't need the eight hours or the nine hours a day in order to do their jobs. And and management is still very uncomfortable with that idea. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so for my next question, uh, we know that you know today's companies are facing unprecedented change. Uh, I mean, every day is something different, you know, between digitization, ESG, new cultural norms, et cetera. How do you feel that companies could develop a strategy that's agile in the face of continuous change so they're not always feeling like they're playing catch up? Yeah, I mean, it, to me, it really gets back to the team concept. Uh, and and uh, a team has a, a mission. Multiple, you know, people can be on multiple teams depending upon the challenges that, that they're they're taking on. Uh in collaboration with management, they're forming what that mission statement looks like. They're figuring out what the desired outcome should be, what the metrics are that track progress towards the desired outcomes, which is a whole discussion in itself because companies are horrible at coming up with what I call learning metrics or progress impact metrics. Um, and so I think that that team structure, allowing people to deal with the uncertainty that they're facing with colleagues is a way that you create uh, agile organizations. I don't think it requires the rigid implementations of SAFE or Scrum or some of these other things that we see in, in R&D, but we can certainly borrow from there. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, we're just, companies have, have completely flipped uh, compared to the industrial age where everything was sort of known and all of the knowledge was in the center of the company. Now all of the information is coming in from the edge of the company, and yet we're still organized the same way. And we kind of need to flip that organization where you're delegating authority out to the edge, able to respond to customer whims and to uh, things that are happening in the world uh, globally. Uh, so I think it's a it's a pretty tall order. Uh, I think the big companies realize this. I think that they end up hiring a lot of very large consulting companies to try to help them solve it. And those large consulting companies are often facing the same issues as the big corporations. And they tend to do these top-down transformations uh, that don't work very well because what you really need is behavior change that's from the ground up. Uh, and so I think that the it's very difficult, but I think that the nice thing is leaders can implement this tomorrow by just thinking about places where they their teams face uncertainty and building that structure to go and tackle that uncertainty and giving them the time and the space and the resources to deal with the, the unknown, the not known. Um, and the biggest objection I hear is leaders, we don't have the time because we have to do all of this execution. And I'm trying to get them to believe that doing exploration work actually increases the efficiency of your execution work. And you just, like everything else, you have to build it into the schedule. You have to put exploration onto the calendar and, you, and, and you'll make time. So I, I think that's, um, I think that's a really important point as far as, again, we've got organizations that are incredibly traditional in the way that they have always thought about their organization, the knowledge being at the center and organizing that way versus really looking at the periphery and looking at knowledge coming in and have being able to empower employees to be able to respond to to different needs. What um what I, I'm curious though is if you can give some more detail as to what would be a strategy that a leader could consider when 
they're trying to move that frozen middle. So like you said, a lot of leaders and top of the organization will make these strategic decisions as to we need to shift, you know, towards ESG. We're seeing this in uh, Europe right now with the Green Deal and all these organizations, all these companies all of a sudden have a whole new set of regulations they have to quickly adhere to. Um, and it's really changing the the landscape of many types of companies, especially pharmaceutical and, and so forth. How, how do you move that middle, that middle salesperson who has been manager, who has been really selling you know, the product one way forever and ever. And now they have to shift their mindset towards a new way of doing business. How do you, how do you get that momentum with that, with those middle managers? Yeah. I mean, that's really the, that's the toughest part. I think that uh, it's sort of a pincer move. You need the top down that bought into it, cheerleading, getting it going. And then the behavior change starts from the, the bottom up and that's who gets squeezed in the middle is the middle management. I think I think they need a lot of new skills development. I think they need new training. And a matter of fact, even new training would probably be the first time they've been trained. I, I'm not sure we ever spent time investing in teaching middle management how to manage. I think that the I can tell them what the benefits are. The benefits are by taking this approach that you're going to be more proactive and more strategic which is really what they want. They don't really want to be fired, fighting fires all day and being reactive because that doesn't really get the attention of their bosses. What gets the attention of their bosses is, is really the, is that they are be, being more strategic. Um, another benefit is, is that they are the ones who can align the work that's being done with the priorities. And this is another thing. It's one of the biggest, in, in most of the surveys that you see in, in large corporations, one of the biggest challenges is that the work being done isn't aligned to the priorities. And to me, this is how a middle manager becomes more strategic is that they are the ones that ensure that the work that's being done on all of these agile teams is actually producing the desired outcomes that, that they've signed up to produce for, for leadership. So how you get there? Well, I think that, I think that the early adopter middle managers really just need to start forming these teams to deal with the, uh, the uncertainty and, and, and the delegation of authority that's really up to them. And there's sort of a trust level that needs to be built there, which is difficult for them. And so they have to tackle uh, sort of near term projects, things that are low risk, but that still face uncertainty so that you can start building the trust between the fact that you've now delegated authority and the teams are able to produce the work that you need. You can start building that trust um, from a more, you know, from a more macro point of view. I think it's that uh, incentives have to be aligned top down and this requires finding the right metrics I guess, you know, a quick little story here. I was working with a, a pretty large association and it was really surprising to me that at the very top level from this, the C-suite and the board, the metrics, the priorities that they were establishing, say, over the next three or four years were really soft. They weren't quantifiable metrics. You know, they want to increase the satisfaction of their members or, you know, they want to increase. Uh, increase the number of uh, the diversity of of their population. But if you don't actually assign the hard numbers to it, then everybody kind of gets to just qualitatively say, yeah, we I think we kind of did that, right? I mean, it's sort of the, in the product world, it's like, well, we were on time and under budget. Yeah, but your product didn't actually have the impact that you wanted. Oh, well, I wasn't signed up for that. I was signed up for on time and under budget. And so it really comes down to what are the right metrics and then holding your leaders accountable to those metrics. And, and that will then start filtering down to the layers of middle management because they have hard numbers other than just revenue. They have hard numbers that they can, they can then give to these teams that you're contributing to this increase in engagement or this increase in diversity or this increase in you know, some a sustainability metric. Um, so I was really surprised about how soft the metrics were. And, and that's a problem. We actually have to, it's almost like the salesperson that you were describing. The salespeople have very hard numbers. And so they know what, 
they actually optimize their behavior to hit those numbers. And if we started doing that in other parts of the organization, I think you would start seeing naturally the behavior that is will rally around achieving those numbers. That's really interesting. Um, my next question is uh, about practices that you would recommend to organizations. So let's say that you have someone that's willing, an organization that that is willing to change. They want to create, let's say, an innovative culture, but they've just gone remote and they're going to stay that way. How do they create this innovative culture? Let's say everyone's willing and on board. Any practices that you've seen that that you would suggest? Well, I think that, you know, I, I think that they need to start developing empathy skills and running experiments and calling out their assumptions and even calling out their biases. And so those are great ways to get started. And again, you can start it on anything. It doesn't really, you know, even if you're an internal back office function, you have internal customers and you can go and develop empathy for what those internal customers are trying to accomplish and what are the obstacles. And then maybe as a human resources team, we can seek to improve the, the hiring practices in order to better serve the hiring managers or here are ways that as a HR group that we can uh, increase the contentedness or the happiness of our employees. And you're running experiments to see if any of those things work. So the, the methods that I talk about in the book around exploration are basically these. It's, you both come from an entrepreneurial background. And so you, you sort of understand this idea of seeking to understand your stakeholders, uh, whether they're customers or internal colleagues. Uh, what are the assumptions that must be true for your solutions to, to, to work? And how do we run experiments to see if, if we're going down the right path, starting small and going big? And those are all skills that are very inherently teachable. And, uh, and to me, those, those are ways to make change in any pockets of the organization. And they sort of shine a light on the impact that you've driven and and you might even be able to create some some momentum around uh, around that behavior change. That's fantastic. And I have um, I can't believe we've literally had a half hour pass so fast. Um, my last question for you is, and it's interesting because just this morning I had a former student who reached out to me. He's speaking on a panel at a big conference in San Francisco around the metaverse, and he was, you know. It was interesting because he was coming to me for advice on really first, how does he deal with his anxiety around public speaking? But the second piece was really around, you know, I, I want to really represent myself as an expert on the metaverse. And, you know, I said to him, what I thought was most important is that he represents himself as a 21 year old who is about to enter into the workforce. And why is the development of the meta metaverse so important? And I'm just really curious to get your perspective. You work with lots of companies, I'm sure lots of young people. What is your take on this, on Gen Z and the generation that's coming in? You know, is it kind of more the same, the idealistic young person who's who's experimenting and looking for opportunity or do you think anything's really uniquely different about this you know this generation coming into the workforce now i think they're up to 30 years old um versus what we've seen with other previous generations well i i do think that there's differences i think that they've that they were born on technology is is kind of different for those of us that that have been part of technology taking over i think if it's always been that way. That's a deep, different perspective. Um, my own perspective is, is that most people in that age range, I have two daughters, 21 and 23, are, are so inundated with information that I think it's going to take them a little bit longer to become what we consider to be fully adult than in the past. I think when we moved from a gregarian, agr agrarian society to industrial age, the, the, that age increased. And I think that going from industrial to digital, it, it's happening again. And it really is this global information and misinformation and the speed of everything. I, you know, I think my brain is still wired completely analog. And, and I just, I think it's different. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I don't know how to affect the workforce. I think there's so many interesting questions. I think that they definitely want to drive impact. And so I think that much of their schooling is still sort of industrial age schooling. And I think that they reject that. And I think that 
you know, there's uh, there's all sorts of movements in education to get people to actually be students to be agile. It's all like project based education. And, and that change is like long overdue. Uh, we need the education to reflect the, the workforce that people are entering. And it's just not industrial age anymore. So I think that this generation is actually kind of still stuck between the, the old and the new in that way. Um, I, you know, I think they tend to be optimistic, but I think it's it's also just a really it's a really complex world, I think. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question at all, but I, I think that they. I don't know. In some ways, my daughters seem to be like tackling with issues that I didn't tackle until my 30s and they are doing it very well. And in other ways, I think that they're still just in learning mode and that they're going to be that way for, well, hopefully they stay in learning mode the rest of their life. But I think it's uh, it's it's been a rough few years, I think, for, for young people. And so uh, I guess my one other thought is that, you know, we're very quick to have this debate about the gig economy and how it's bad for labor and all these type of things. And I, I think that we need a new perspective on what it means to be pro-labor. And I think a lot of that is around allowing people to the freedom that they want in their work. And that that is actually not only going to be a more valuable and worthwhile way to live one's life, I think that the solutions will be better that way. And so it's really interesting to me to see if companies and and uh, and government and other organizations figure out a way to allow workers to have this freedom to express their creativity and exercise their intelligence in a way that uh, you know sort of only a few have been able to do in the past. Yeah, I, th I uh, completely agree. It's really fascinating you just brought that up because I've been doing a lot of research recently on the gig economy and the interim worker. And globally, it's just so different from country to country based on regulations and worker protection laws and things like that of, of permanent workers versus temporary workers. But what you're what's emerging is this new persona of someone highly skilled, high EQ, project oriented, mission oriented, who wants flexibility that's opting for this as a career path. And it's really fascinating to watch. And it's kind of interesting to see the disruption they make when they come into organizations and they perform at such a high level. So yeah. um, Brant, it was a pleasure to have you with us on the Happy at Work podcast. Thanks so much for joining. I, I hope you come back and talk to us again soon. Happy to. Thank you for having me. It was a fun discussion. So thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to hear future episodes, be sure to subscribe to the Happy at Work podcast and leave us a review with your thoughts. Are you interested in speaking on a future episode or want to collaborate with us? Let us know. You can send us an email at admin at happyatworkpodcast.com. And lastly, follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter for even more happiness. See you soon.